uh, thanks Maya for organizing this uh, uh, coffee talk. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Venki uh, Anna Warner Research Fellow here at MBA. Uh, uh, today in this uh, short coffee talk, I will give a, a brief overview of my uh, current research and also some insights from our recent uh, uh, research work. In our lab, we are basically interested in studying uh, early branching uh, metazoans. Uh, particularly the sponges and cnidarians. Uh, cnidarians, as you know, uh, it mainly includes uh, sea anemone, jellyfishes, and uh, stony corals. Uh, one of the key difference between the cnidaria and uh, bilaterians is that they lack bilateral symmetry. They are generally radial, uh, and also they lack uh, uh, mesoderm, which is uh, they only have uh, ectoderm and uh, endoderm. In between, they have these non-cellular uh, mesoglia. Uh, and also, uh, the, the name obviously, the cnidaria, comes from their uh, uh, specialized cells known as uh, cnidocytes, uh, which uh, uh, use, they use them for uh, stinging, uh, for prey and predator. Uh, so, uh, why we are interested in studying the early branching metazoans? Because, uh, as we know, the last common ancestor of animals no longer exist. Uh, the only way to understand uh, uh, about the origin and evolution of the animals is to uh, study a different uh, phyletic groups and then fill in those gaps uh, so that we can have more insights on this topic. Uh, for instance, uh, in our lab, we are interested in uh, uh, studying the uh, studying the uh, nervous system in the cnidarians. Uh, so, uh, cnidarians are the one of the first uh, 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 animals to evolve with a true nervous system, which is uh, homologous to the uh, bilaterians. Uh, however, their nervous system is quite simple, uh, uh, known as nerve net. They don't have any centralized nervous system like uh, in human, for example, brain and spinal cord, but they still possess neurons, which forms the building blocks of their nervous system and also perform a very complex behaviors like what you see here. <laughs> Uh, moving on, uh, we are not interested in mainly in the adult nervous system, but more about uh, the development and also uh, uh, basically uh, the larval sensory structure known as a apical organ. Uh, so uh, the apical organ is a uh, is a, a sensory structure in found in majority of the ciliated larvae of uh, marine invertebrates. Uh, they are, it ma mainly appears during the planktonic phase. Uh, it's mainly uh, consists of a non-motile uh, cilia known as apical turf, and they also have these apical cells and uh, dense neurons. A uh, number of uh, behavioral studies suggested that uh, the apical organ is involved in uh, sensing the environmental signals and also modulates uh, uh, the swimming behavior of these uh, uh, ciliated larvae. Uh, and also, they suggest that uh, the apical organ is involved in triggering the metamorphosis of the larvae. Uh, I, it is very important because uh, this defines uh, uh, their survival success of the species. Um, so how are we still lacking some of the molecular insights uh, about the apical organ? For example, how the apical organ sends the environmental uh, uh, signals and how we send this information to the downstream uh, and modulate the swimming behavior. So in our lab, we are mainly interested to unreveal these uh, uh, secrets. Uh, so we are mainly interested in the cnidarian uh, uh, apical organ. Uh, the one of the key reason, as I mentioned before, the cnidarian nervous system is a homologous to the bilaterian. And the second thing is that uh, even though the sensory structures are also found in the sponges and tenophora, the true apical organ is uh, uh, which is homologous to the bilaterian is first evolved in the cnidarians. Uh, uh, so in overall, the phyletic position of the cnidarians plays a prominent role here because they are sister to the bilaterians. If we understand more information in the cnidarian uh, apical organ and compare it with the bilaterians, we can identify uh, or understand what is what was the common scenario in the ancestor. So, uh, so far in our, uh, we, we are using Nematostella as a lab model. Uh, Nematostella is a sea anemone belonging to the cnidarian anthozoans. Uh, in nature, they are found in uh, uh, brackish lagoons. But in the lab, we can culture in these uh, uh, 
uh, in these aquarium facilities, uh, like uh, zebrafish facilities, um, and you can induce them overnight to produce uh, thousands of eggs, uh, which is very important as a, as a lab model to carry out any developmental studies. Uh, and that genome is uh, sequenced and well annotated. We also have uh, uh, transcriptome profiles from different developmental stages. Uh, most importantly, uh, we can also carry out gene manipulation on these animals, for example, like CRISPR, which is very important if you want to study a gene function or categorize it uh, during the development. So, uh, so far uh, in our lab, uh, we uh, used uh, some unique uh, uh, transcriptome techniques to reveal uh, the apical organ genes. As you can see over here, uh, uh, the in situ hybridization stain uh, staining the apical organ genes, which we identified recently. Uh, they are unique to the apical organ, and also we were able to classify the uh, some of the cell types which are associated with the apical organ. Uh, and most importantly, we identified some of the putative neuropeptides, uh, which probably involve in the modulating the larval behavior. Uh, so now currently we are uh, uh, still working on it. We aim to characterize some of these genes we identified through gene manipulation using the microinjection system, uh, which is available at MBA. And also we uh, want to study the larval behavior uh, uh, by using those uh, neuropeptides uh, to see how it modulates the swimming behavior and also the ciliary movement of the uh, larvae. Uh, with this, I will uh, uh, stop uh, this topic on the apical organ, move on to another interesting topic we are working in our lab, uh, which is, uh, uh, studying the regeneration in the sponge. Uh, I believe uh, most of you are already familiar with the, uh, the sponges. Uh, they lack a true tissue uh, and also complex structures like they don't have digestive system or nervous system and muscles like in Nidaria. Uh, uh, so even though the topic about the regeneration been there in the field for a long time, for more than a century, uh, I think it's it been a bit overlooked. I think mainly because uh, uh, their uh, simple uh, structure of the animals. Uh, uh, but the recent uh, uh, evidences uh, from uh, their genome and also uh, uh, advanced techniques like single cell uh, transcriptome uh, sequencing and also uh, the number of developmental studies in the sponges reveal that uh, uh, their genome has uh, uh, a, approximately uh, uh, 40,000 uh, genes, which is uh, literally uh, almost double the size of uh, uh, human coding genes. And also uh, from the single cell transcriptome from two independent species, Amphimidon, Queen Salantica, and Spongelia, revealed that uh, they have a, a wide range of cell types uh, with uh, distinctive uh, transcriptome uh, profiles. Uh, and also the developmental studies revealed that uh, they express some of the genes which uh, play a prominent role in the development of bilaterians, including like us. Uh, so in overall, suggesting that even though they look like very simple uh, filter, filtering uh, uh, animals, they still possess a complex uh, cell diversity. And uh, it's very important to understand uh, how they evolved. Uh, so go going back to the regeneration topic, uh, if we try to scale the regeneration across the animal kingdom, um, starting from the human, uh, our cell regeneration ability mainly resides at the cellular level. Uh, we can uh, repair the tissues uh, by uh, wound healing, etc. Uh, whereas other animals like lizards, frogs, uh, axitols, and sea uh, stars, they can replace a, a whole uh, uh, part of the body, like for they, they can replace their lost limbs or uh, tails, etc. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, animals like flatworm, like a planaria, and also in cnidarians and porifera animals, they, if you chop them into small tissue pieces, they can regrow from any part of this tissue. That's a, a, a truly a remarkable regeneration ability. Uh, in case of the sponge, beyond this, they can also redevelop from completely dissociated uh, cells. I think uh, that's a, a very unique uh, phenomenon, uh, very rare to observe. Uh, so we use that uh, unique system to understand how they can redevelop from these completely dissociated cells. So in, in general, when you think about the regeneration in the sponge, you may think that uh, after dissociation, they just aggregate and form, transform into these uh, 
functional sponge but i think it's a a, a bit uh, uh, misconception but if you provide a right condition for these dissociated cells they go through these series of morphological events what we observe here before they transform into a completely functional sponge this is very interesting uh, as because uh, when we compared these uh, regeneration uh, uh, morphological signatures with the regular uh, development uh, post embryonic development of the sponge we observed that most of these morphological signature actually mimics the the regular uh, post embryonic development this is very interesting uh, and actually brings us to very old question in the field uh, from by one of those uh, early pioneers in the in the regeneration like Huxley and Thomas what is the correlation between the regeneration and the development does the regeneration say, share any similarity uh, or is it replicating the development so uh, to address uh, this age old question not only just comparing the regeneration morphologically with the uh, post embryonic development we also want to carry out a transcriptome on the on the regeneration samples and compare with the development so we collected uh, regenerating samples from different time points and carry out the transcriptome and compared with the post embryonic development and uh, when we when we received the data it, for our surprise we identified that uh, regeneration has uh, approximately 50% of genes which are commonly expressed in the post uh, uh, embryonic development uh, that's very surprising and among these uh, differentially expressed genes we identified uh, those some of those uh, uh, developmental genes which were previously categorized in the uh, psychoconciliatum by maja et maski group that they play a prominent role in their development like uh, bodies uh, planning etc uh, it is uh, uh, so this suggests that probably regeneration uh, is is replicating the post uh, uh, embryonic development by recruiting the, those uh, similar pathways uh, and, and another thing we when we compared the global gene expression between the post embryonic development and regeneration we observed that those early time points uh, are not actually uh, entirely overlapping uh, i think it is very obvious because these uh, regenerating samples are not uh, coming from any zygote or uh, larval tissues they are basically the adult cells they are going through this tremendous shock of dissociation where they are trying to uh, 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 adjust here before they uh, go under the regeneration in fact uh, some of the things we observed are uh, like for example apoptosis uh, is one of the thing which is very known in uh, majority of the bilaterians also that region uh, during regeneration apoptosis plays a prominent role by replacing those uh, uh, un, uh, unwanted cells with the more uh, 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 cells which are appropriate for the regeneration uh, and however as they progress through the regeneration they overlap at uh, by the time they reach to the their uh, uh, end psychonoid uh, uh, stage as you can see also from this dendrogram the late stages from the the regeneration uh, are overlapping with the uh, uh, late stages of the post embryonic development uh, I think uh, with this, uh, the, the work, we, we, we are still progressing on this. Uh, we are trying to identify what are those cell types involved in the regeneration. Uh, but uh, I believe uh, our, our uh, work has uh, contributed to, the, to that one uh, age old uh, question, what is the correlation between the regeneration and uh, uh, development? Uh, it seems that regeneration do recruit some of the pathways which are necessary for the development. And on above all, the sponge uh, uh, is, a, is a best, one of the best model to carry out these kind of uh, uh, studies to understand what are the changes happening at the cellular level uh, during those early regeneration. Uh, in addition to the regeneration, one of the uh, other interesting question we want to uh, uh, ask, can we start, use these uh, early time points of the regeneration where they transforming from the single cell state to the multicellular structures uh, can we understand what are those signaling molecules involved in triggering this uh, transition uh, as we know the sponges are the likely the one of the first animal uh, or at least close to the one of those first uh, multicellular organisms which are ancestor to the animals uh, uh, the the phyletic position of the sponge is still debatable uh, with the tenophora i'm not 
going to take a stand on any of them. But if we try to look from the sponge perspective, uh, the number of studies from the single cell or organisms like in from the conoflagellates, the conoflagellates are the closest living relative of the animals. Uh, they are the single cell or organisms. Uh, when you provide, uh, usually they are in, uh, in the single cell or form, but if you provide the right conditions, they can transform into these uh, multicellular structures known as rosetta. Uh, when you compare uh, the, the conoflagellates with the conocytes of the sponge, actually uh, they have a similar morphology like you, what you can see here. Uh, and and on a, uh, in addition to that, uh, if you compare the, the conocyte chambers, which are the functional units of the sponge, with the conoflagellate rosetta structures, they actually resemble the, in the same way. Uh, uh, the theory basically suggests that probably there is a, a, a single cell or organisms which are close relative of the animals, uh, like conoflagellates, uh, they, they, which have an ability to uh, transform into these colony-like structures. But during, uh, uh, at some point in the evolution, they, these uh, uh, identical cells may have undergone uh, uh, differentiation to give rise to uh, 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 other cells with a unique function and eventually uh, uh, developed into a, a multicellular organism which is close related to the animals. So uh, what we are trying to uh, study by using the regeneration uh, system from the sponge is that uh, if we try to understand those signaling molecules which are expressed in those early time points, which uh, involve in uh, transforming the single cell to the multicellular structures, uh, we can have more insights on, on uh, how these single cell organisms transformed into multicellular organisms. So here we identified that some of the cell adhesion and ECM molecules are uh, usually expressed at the early time points. In fact, from several single cell organisms like uh, conoflagellates, uh, in their genome, they also express these genes. And uh, some of the recent studies suggested that probably these similar molecules are involved in, uh, in their transformation into multicellular structures. I think uh, with this, I will end my uh, presentation and uh, thank uh, my students, uh, uh, brilliant and uh, uh, very enthusiastic uh, students, uh, 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 MRS students and uh, undergrads, and also uh, uh, Anna Warner for the fellowship and uh, MBA and the staff. Uh, and thank you.